fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCP 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. And uh, joining us now on the line from uh, a little island back east, um, Jeffrey Wansel. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure, Al. I'm looking forward to it. So, now, first of all, this, uh, this is the first time on the show. So, uh, tell the audience how you got involved in uh, writing all these crime books and uh, getting into this whole crime. <laughs> it's a very long story, but uh, I'll try and tell it as quickly as I can. Back in 1995, I was in L.A., uh, researching and finishing a second book about the wonderful British movie star Cary Grant. And my agent in England rang me up and said, the, uh, this is something might be quite difficult for the American audience, but the official solicitor to the Supreme Court, which is rather a grand figure in England, is looking for someone to write an official biography of the British serial killer Frederick West who uh, killed 12, at least 12. And I said, why me? I've never done anything like this before. And my agent said, well, do you want to go in for it? And I said, well, sure. Well, well, okay. I wasn't really sure, but I said, well, okay, it's a job. And so I wrote, honestly, the worst outline I've written in my entire career. (laughs) 50 50 or more years doing this. It was terrible. But I get back to England, and my agent rings me and says, they want you to do it. I said, I don't believe it. And so I, well, okay. Uh, So I go and have a meeting, and they say, well, we're going to give you all West papers and his prison diary and all of the above. And you have to sign all these confidentiality agreements because Rosemary West, his wife, hadn't got on trial yet. And they didn't want me to in any way prejudice a trial. Neither did the Gloucestershire police. So, okay, i am suddenly got this gig. And never done anything like it before. I hadn't been to Gloucester. I hadn't been to the Cromwell Street at that point. And so I go to Rosemary's trial. On the first Saturday of the trial... I'm invited to a solicitor's office, which I can't reveal where it is, nor can I reveal what the name is, because of confidentiality agreements. And so I turn up, it's a Saturday morning, and I meet a delightful little man who says, yes, follow me, follow me, he says, beckoning into this very plush uh, solicitor's, uh, lawyer's office, attorney's office in uh, uh, London. And there's a door And it, believe it or not, it really was called Room K. And anyway, unlocks the door. It's got no windows. It's got a small table in the middle with a phone on it. And in the side, it's got a very large grey metal filing cabinet, which is a, a jumble, literally a jumble of cassette tapes and files, including police interviews and all that. And the nice little man says to me, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to lock you in. You can't take anything out. And when you need to leave, ring this number, this phone on the little desk, on the little table. Uh, So it's a bit eerie. So he leaves and locks me in. So I look at this. I mean, this is absolutely true. I look at this great filing cabinet, and in the middle of it is quite a small cardboard box. And... So I think, well, I'll have a look in the cardboard box first. So I take the cardboard box out and open it, and it includes Frederick West's clothes. 
all the way down to his underpants, his shoes and his socks. Because, of course, they're part of his estate, his belongings. Well, I think one's life changes at a moment like that because nothing is ever the same again. And so I put that back in and I take out one cassette literally at random and I put it into the cassette player and I push the play button and there is Frederick Walter Stephen West, little Herefordshire, um, Gloucestershire voice, describing in the most incredible detail how he cut up his daughter Heather's body and shoved it in a dustbin. That's how I started. Wow. I guess yeah, after wow. I guess after seeing his underwear, that would be <laughs> underpants. Under well, you call them something else, but we call them underpants. Over. Yeah, I I hope they wash them. No, they didn't. No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so absolutely no. not. They were unwashed. I assure you. Oh my <laughs> God! You know, imagine what you'd make if you put them on great on on the internet and sell them <laughs> on eBay. They yeah. weren't mine. For the estate. <laughs> <laughs> But oh, genuinely, nothing, none of it was washed. Nothing. Wow. Uh, and it was very, very eerie. Can you imagine, in a room with no windows, you can't get out unless you ring up a certain number, and you're there with a serial killer, and in the end, absolutely no doubt that he was a very considerable killer with his underpants. It is quite an extraordinary story. Yeah. Well, why, why was it so... Um secure like that with the with this clothes because they were very afraid that because i was an outsider in other words i wasn't a policeman or a member of the cps that i might go blubbing or blabbing to the world at large which might prejudice rosemary west's trial because she was at that point being tried for 10 murders at winchester crown court now, I didn't, of course I didn't, I didn't reveal anything I knew that I'd signed so many agreements that I couldn't, but they were genuinely afraid that I might. Well, you know, I, but your your laws, the laws in the UK are quite a bit tighter. If you, if you did reveal, couldn't you go to jail for contempt? Well, I, I didn't really want to go to jail for contempt, but it, I, yes, I could have done, absolutely. And indeed, all the work I've done in this area, there are times when you do put yourself at risk. There's no doubt of that. You said you were writing a book about Cary Grant originally. Yep. I, I was. That's quite a change. Cary Grant was not really... Um, no. Like evil. No, no. He was strange, but he certainly wasn't evil. <laughs> There's no question of that. Um... But I'd met him in England, and then I'd gone to L.A. to write about him, and he wouldn't talk to me, and he would talk to me, and it was one of those things. And I, funnily enough, I have a book in America at the moment, still selling, called Dark Angel, about Cary Grant. It's a picture book with quite a lot of words, but I mean, good pictures. And I'm astonished by how many copies it sells every year. He has a considerable, enduring following. Um, because he was one of Hollywood's great stars. But he wasn't anything to do with murder. No. No. Um, no I'm not suggesting for one moment there ever was any suggestion. No, I, it's quite a jump. I, I, I've written some books myself. I couldn't imagine writing, um, going into a biography of, a, of an actor now, after doing murder. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know that I could go back to an actor, but I just recently, not that long ago, written a book with an actor I'm very fond of, a great friend, who played Hercule Poirot for many years, 25 years, called David Suchet. And we wrote a book together called Poirot and Me, um, which was enormous fun and a great relief from the murder. <laughs> now, uh, when we... W I look at your books, and I know that uh, I, I, I have pure evil and lifers. And um, yeah. in, in both those books, um, you, you talk a lot about uh, the, the killers. Now, what's your thought on the way the serial killers and the mass murderers are of today? Are, are they progressing from what they were in the 60s and 70s? I... I'm 
Alan, not sure they are. I think in the end, a psychopath, sociopath, whatever you want to call them, are, are of a particular kind. And I don't think it changes very much. All the conventional rules apply. Uh, a troubled child, possibly abused, uh, practices um, as a, a, a young boy um, hurting animals, setting them on fire, killing cats, progresses to arson, progresses to petty theft, petty crime, and then escalates into murder. It's often rape and then murder. Now, that's the classic escalator. Uh, for serial killers. Actually, it hasn't changed a very great deal. I've recently done... Um, uh, I have a podcast in England, which, thankfully, is also played in America and around the world. And there are lots of continuums that lots of people talk about the same sort of things, they react in the same sort of way, it's, it's, no, it, there's no convention, but there are indicators along the road. And I think they really haven't changed that much. I, I, so what do you think the, um, what motivates um, these killers? Um, and, narcissists. And, oh. They're narcissists, almost all of them. Narcissism is one of the great characteristics of serial killers. Um, they care about themselves. They see their killing as a way of indicating how significant they are. They are people who have to be taken seriously. And to prove it, they kill. Now, it's not quite... It's, uh, that's a simple explanation, but it's very important. A great deal of the psychopathology of serial killers around the world rotates around a very precise narcissistic tendency in themselves. Now, uh, do you, do you, did you find that um, serial killers have any sort of sorrow or remorse or, or regret? No. Almost without exception, they have no regret. They are not capable of empathy. They are capable only of considering themselves and what they want, their control, their power. They have no empathy whatever. Ted Bundy, whom I'm, I'm fascinated by, I think, you know, the Netflix series was absolutely excellent. Uh, the tapes were interesting. I thought I'd love more of them. Bundy was a man who was charismatic, attractive to women, incredibly agreeable, could literally charm the birds off the trees, but underneath it all, Bundy was brutal, callous, uncaring about anyone except himself. And the same is true of Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer. I mean, in many ways, one of the most intelligent of all the American serial killers and yet, in the end, was desperate to kill his mother, but it took him, what, seven murders before he finally killed his mother. So now, you know, if we, if we could, um, could have a more stricter um, sort of penalty, uh, it's not going to stop serial killers, is it? You'll never stop serial killers, Al. They will, you, you can have the worst penalty in the world. You could have the guillotine. It wouldn't stop them. They are just there. There's nothing you can do about it. It is simply part of the psyche of a certain number of individuals. There aren't many, and it's rare. In many cases, extremely rare. But nevertheless, no matter what you face them with, literally having their heads cut off in uh, New York, in you know, Times Square, it wouldn't change anything. They would still do it, and they would still want to do it. You can't stop them with penalties. Do you consider it an addiction? I consider it a psychopathology. I don't know about addiction, 
because you never know. Classically, serial killers escalate. You've only got to watch Criminal Minds and all those, you know, BAU shows. They classically escalate. But there's nothing anyone can do, and I'm not being in any way disregarding of the benefits of the criminal justice system, but there's nothing anyone can do to stop that escalation. It is in their psychopathology. That's really interesting. Um, do you find that um, there was one particular case that sort of sticks out above the rest in um, a lot of the serial killers? Well, it would probably be fair, as you know, you're in the States and I'm in England, so I should choose an American example. There was nothing that would have stopped Manson, although Manson, of course, never killed anyone himself. Manson was simply driven by the desire to control his family and then the people the family targeted. Ed Kemper, the co-ed killer, in the end, nothing would have stopped him. The death penalty would not have stopped either of them. I'm, I'm sorry, I, 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 I'm very conflicted about whether the death penalty is any kind of uh, fear to a person who wants to kill a lot of people. And I've come to the conclusion after quite a long time that I don't think it is. I think in the end, the death penalty, because as you know, in America, you can be on death row for 20, 25 years. In this country, in England, in the United Kingdom, uh, we no longer have a death penalty. I'm, I am not sure there's any penalty that would stop that kind of continuous killing. It's the character of the individual who wants to kill. Look at, look at John Wayne Gacy. Look at the man who pretended to be a pillar of society, you know, played the clown, was the representative, and yet he was killing and burying under his house young men whom he had abused and then killed. Gacy wasn't going to be put off by the fact that he might or might not have died. When you're when you're interviewing these uh, serial killers, um, what do you, how do you get through what they're they're trying to to push on you or sell? I think that um, a lot of serial killers are going to try and manipulate you, um, or they want something. Um, that's been my experience. So wh what's yours? Well, mine is, is, is exactly the same. Any uh, serial killer, if he wants to talk to you, which not all of them do, uh, will want to persuade you that they are actually a terribly reasonable human being, and they've done nothing wrong at all, and they're, you know, a victim of a miscarriage of justice. And I don't, I don't, I entirely accept that what they think or what they want you to think. My view is a bit, I'm afraid, a bit more cynical. We have a, a, a man in England called Jeremy Bamber who killed five members of his family in a thing called the White House Farm Murders. Now, I have a, had a long correspondence with Bamber, and Bamber never, ever once admits that there's a possibility that he may have been guilty. He always says the same thing. It wasn't me. I was set up by the police. The forensic evidence is wrong. And I've had that experience time and time and time again. That Levi Belfield, the killer of a, a young girl in England called Millie Dowler. Oh, no, no, it wasn't me. I didn't. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. In America, I think one of the interesting things about, not about Bundy, because Bundy effectively did it, sort of admit that he did it, did it, but Gacy denied it to the end. I mean, that, there's something in that character 
that is in complete denial. Do you think that it is the narcissist, uh, the narcissistic part of these killers that won't allow them to admit that they've done it? They don't want the world to perceive them as uh, the evil things that they really are, even though it would be... That's a very interesting question. I think there are two issues here. One, they don't want the world to know. And two, they do want the world to know. They want to be famous. They want genuinely want to be remembered as, oh, that was the guy who killed and buried all those hikers at Green River. Oh, that, but they're equally in themselves. They want to say, no, no, it wasn't me. So it's a very interesting contrast. They want the fame, but they also don't want to admit it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know how you resolve that, Mike. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in that schizophrenic part of a personality which says to themselves when they're sitting at home having supper or whatever, and they know they've just cut up their latest victim. Well, that's not really me. That's another me. Yeah, that's it's how not really that, me. that's how Bundy dealt with it. Was uh, absolutely. It, in the third person and, and yeah. talking about it as though it was some entity outside himself. Yeah. And uh, also, uh, Son of Sam did that as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you deliver it outside yourself so you can deny it to yourself. And yet, and yet, and I think it's important, they glory in it. They love the notoriety. Almost everyone I've ever talked to, there are one or two exceptions, always, in the end, almost preens themselves, puffs themselves up about, Mm -hmm. look at me, how famous I am. And I actually amounted to nothing, which many of them amounted to nothing. One that stood out to me in that regard was uh, Jeffrey Dahmer and how he was actually a bit quite contrite at the end which is rather bizarre I think it's an un- he's in a way the example the sort of exception that proves, proves the rule Dharma was contrite at the end but nevertheless it didn't stop him mm-hmm. I don't think contrition and remorse really figure in multiple murderers I don't think they think like that. I think they think, I want what I want. I'm going to cut her head off. I'm going to shove her in a bin bag. I'm going to bury her in the garden. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to do unspeakable things to her corpse. That's where their desire lies. They don't see consequences. They just live in the in that moment for the for the high. They live in that moment for the fantasy as well. Yeah, they've always fantasized about this is what I want to do. There are so many examples of that, but they live in that moment of this is the fantasy. I'm going to live it out. I'm going to do it. Hang the consequences. They now, don't even you, think about the consequences. You've written about Kemper as well. Yeah. Um, he he stopped after after his mother. Do you think that had he not turned himself in, that he would have continued? No, I think Kemper. I think Kemper is incredibly interesting, and I, I also think the first series of Mindhunter is incredibly good. Mm-hmm. But Kemper is very interesting. Kemper wanted to kill his mother, but didn't know how to do it, and in the end, killed his grandparents, worked up to his mother, killed his mother, and he didn't need to do anything else. Kemper, yes, of course, he killed, was it eight? Yes, it was, mm-hmm. um, including his mother. But in the end, his mother was like the, well, I've done it now. I've, I've fulfilled my dream. I can now go back to being, what is he, the perfect prisoner, uh, and the man who organizes um, psychiatric appointments for his fellow prisoners, works in the prison library, is the most agreeable prisoner in history. He's 
you know, except for the fact that he's seven foot two and fantastically frightening, um, you know, Kemper is, well, quotes reformed, except you wouldn't let Kemper out into the street again, I don't think. Hopefully not. I would, I would, hopefully not too. Uh, Mike, Mike looks just a lot like Kemper. They're, they're I, twins. I, I actually do. <laughs> Right, that's frightening. <laughs> I'm, I'm not that tall, though. I'm, I'm like a five foot seven inch version of Kemper. Well, Kemper is very large overall, isn't he? I mean, he's still with us, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm very large, uh, <laughs> wide wise. <laughs> well, Kemper was wide. <laughs> yeah. He's wide. Sorry. It's a radio, yeah. radio body. <laughs> I, you know, it's funny. And Rodney Alcala, you know, I did, I did the the Killing Game book. I'm, I'm the guy that wrote the Dating Game Killer. Yeah, yeah. I wrote the original book, and I, uh, um, you know, he spoke about himself in third person as well. Yeah, because yeah. he, he, even right to when he got arrested, you know, um, yes. St- Steve O'Dell said, "Okay, well, why would you do it?" And he goes, "Oh, you want to talk about Rodney?" Yeah. Which well, is, a lot of people say there have been so many defenses, haven't there? As yeah. you both know very well about it, it's my other alter ego it's the nasty me that kills but i'm the ordinary me you know it's such a familiar defense both in america and in the uk um oh no it was um jason or whoever you want to call him who really did the killings and it wasn't me i think that is another of those interesting conflicts um between the individual and the individual's alter ego, which says, gosh, I know I'm bad, but it's not really me being bad, it's some other bit of me. It's yeah, very, I wish, I, wish I could blame my donut eating on, on the evil <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, well, you're never going to manage that, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no penalty that'll deter him. No, no, there's not. But but do, do you see what I mean? That it is such an interesting contrast, and it's so familiar across the world. You can do it in Europe. Uh, you can do it in America. You can do it in South America. Time after time, you find uh, people who have killed more than once talk about their other self, the other me. A different person. It's extraordinary, and it's it's a kind of well, I suppose it's a kind of excuse. Not to bring fiction into it, but uh, the the serial killer Dexter called it his dark passenger. Yes, I yeah. absolutely. I always and like you, that description. Yeah, but it's an interesting point, isn't it? That so often you have. People who have committed dreadful series of crimes, most utterly obscene crimes, can say to themselves when they get to court and to their attorney or to their lawyer in England, oh no, actually, it uh, it wasn't me, it was my other me. And we have a lot of defence in England called diminished responsibility. You have it in the the United States as well. Oh, I, I, I wasn't I wasn't in control of myself. Now if somebody kills relentlessly, I find it very difficult to understand how you can't admit to yourself that it was you. But but I understand that they do. Now when you say they have no empathy, they don't they don't really feel the same about uh, the people they've killed. But yet they they have the ability. They don't feel they don't feel for anything for anybody but themselves. So, but they have the ability to love or no. I I would challenge you to find me a single real serial killer around the world who was capable of love. A lot of people are capable of feigning love, but I'm not so sure. Mm-hmm. Love implies that you want to embrace another human being. Anyone who works in the area of, anyone who commits these sorts of crimes, 
is really not capable of that emotion. They can feign it, but I don't think they're capable of it. Now, there, I, can, I can hear people immediately saying, oh, well, what about Dr. Crippen and Ethel and Eve? Didn't he love her and that's the reason he killed his wife and gave her all her jewellery and they ran away? I think Crippen only really cared about himself. Mm-hmm. And I think the same is true almost universally. There will obviously be an exception, but almost universally I think that's the case. This isn't a very cheery conversation, is it? Oh, I'm having a great time. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I'm too. just coffee and death. Um, I, I just, I just... It's very gloomy, <laughs> a bit dark. <laughs> Well, that's who we are. Um, that's my personality. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's only because you're here. No, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's killing the donuts as we speak. <laughs> They're not killing the donuts. Oh, dear. That's terrible. <laughs> well, it, you know, it's pretty interesting. And um, I, just, I just wonder if there's really going to be any way to... Um, determine who will be a serial killer and who won't and and if there's any sort of cure for this or there's any sort of remedy no um uh, two two phrases always stick in my mind Uh, bad things happen to good people and which is absolutely true and there's no such thing as fair life is incredibly unfair and it'll never be anything else. So extraordinarily innocent, naive maybe sometimes, but equally maybe very clever, people fall into the hands of men or women, and there are some women, who do dreadful things to them. We are never, ever going to be able to stop that. And I do not think, I'm happy for the United States to have the death penalty, I'm not, I'm not arguing against death row, but nothing in the end will stop them. I'm sorry, that's a very bleak view, but I'm absolutely convinced of it. Well, um, so we'll we'll keep Mike on chains. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't give him too many donuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, it's just it's just really. Um, so, is there any differences? Have you noticed any differences in serial killers in England as compared to the States or Canada, or Australia? I would say that England, the, 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 usually the numbers are smaller. Uh, America, usually the numbers are larger. Australia, the numbers are smaller. There are some very interesting examples in Europe um, where there are quite large numbers that people don't find because it's easy because you move around between the countries. Um, the classic major American serial killers are much, much higher numbers. Um, now, maybe that's because you have that state system that if well, let's go back to Bundy. You could move from California to Utah to Wisconsin and end up in Florida. You can move around and the dots are not always connected. In England, you can do it, but you have to be a bit cleverer because the dots can be connected more quickly. In Australia, they don't even think of connecting the dots. They don't they don't have serial killers in their minds. Um, how could that be? I don't. They're so wonderful. They don't think, quote, it could be a serial killer, and he might be in Melbourne, or he might be in Perth, or he might be in Darwin, he might be in Brisbane. Their minds don't work like that. But in America now, didn't used to be. In America now, you very much work like that. You have a very sophisticated system. I'm. I'm huge admiration for it. Very sophisticated. Um, 
not necessarily VICAP, because I think that's been a bit neglected by the FBI, but um, you, know, you have a very sophisticated system. There's also a lot of spree shooters in the United States as compared to um, We other have very countries. few. Yeah. I, yeah uh, we, the UK has had Dunblane, Hungerford, uh, Cumbria, basically three in the last 25 years. You have spree killings. I'm, it's awful to say, and I, forgive me, but you have them a lot. Every day. There's, there was another one today outside of uh, Walmart oh. in Oklahoma. Oh, I'm so... I mean, it's, it's, it's tragic, and I don't understand it. Yeah. I, I, that spree killing is not the same in any way as serial killing. Spree killing has an entirely different psychological motive. Um, serial killing is quite, quite different. And so, um, serial killers try, uh, plan on living through it. They do. Spree killers almost all, always want to die. Mm. It, they want to end up with suicide by cop. Yeah, yeah. Serial killers want to be remembered. Now, we could talk about a, a spree killers in America. Who can remember the name of more than one spree killer in the last 10 years? Answer, no one. People remember serial killers. So you're saying we should go into the serial killing business, not spree killing? <laughs> no, I'm saying neither. Believe me, I'm not. But I think it's very interesting. <laughs> spree killers are interested in their own moment of volcanic eruption. They're not about their legend or their legacy. That's a different issue. Serial killers are very, very concerned with their legacy, their name. Same in this country. Levi Belfield, a man who killed three women and almost killed a fourth. He, to this day, loves the notoriety. That's the whole point. They want to be remembered. Ted Bundy wanted to be remembered. Spree killers do not care about that. That's not where they are. Do you, do you have any idea why, why do you think there's so many spree killings in the U.S. compared to the world? Um, of course, the axis of guns, but, but the actual act in itself, like, uh, like Mike was saying, one in Walmart last night, there was one in Fresno of... 16 people um, it just it seems to be almost daily uh, Al I, I, I wish I could give you a, a really clear answer my, my without going into the whole gun control issue which is you know we've been there we've got the t-shirt we know how the argument works but I think it's a lot to do with rage I think it's to do with I feel I'm underappreciated, I'm disrespected, as we would say in this country. People don't take me seriously enough, and I'm going to make a point. It's usually people with low self-esteem. It's usually people who feel that they've been uh, ignored and, and, and not taken seriously. But I think it's a tragedy. I think it's an American tragedy, and I... I Believe me, I sympathise entirely with you. Thankfully, in this country, we don't have quite the same level of it, and I'm not attributing it. I'm not attributing it only to gun control, but I do think there's also there must be something to do with the nature of the psyche. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's something in the culture. Why aren't we yeah. giving them enough praise? Why aren't we? Um, but, you know, I can contradict my own thesis. Uh, uh, some of our spree killers have usually been in... Uh, the, the trigger has been dislike for their brother. They think their brother has dis them, disrespected them. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable. Okay, Jeffrey. Now, so you've got a uh, podcast out there. Let's tell listeners how they can uh, 
catch you on 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 air if you if you go to any of your podcast platforms we're on a platform called audio boom but you can find us in all other ways um if you put into your iphone you know podcasts and you tap in blood ties which is my daughter and i we do we've been doing it for two years we're just about to do a live one in in london about jack the ripper cool probably the most famous british crime um unsolved british crime so do you do you tackle mostly british cases yeah but we have done uh bundy kemper and john wayne gacy okay and we're going to do rodney alcala alcala and a couple more of the americans no so not just uh british ones but we started out literally um doing british crimes uh, but it's been astonishing people are fascinated and we get a lot of letters um, I've, only, I've answered two today uh, mm. both from america saying love it and could you tell would you do this and could you do that and what would you might you do it, the people are so interested yeah one of the things happened extraordinary al since i started back all those years ago in 95 with frederick west when there wasn't really a great deal of interest in true crime now the interest is extraordinary literally extraordinary oh yeah well, I, I cover i'm i'm canadian so i do a true crime podcast where i cover mostly canadian cases and i feel like people are very thirsty for cases other than the ones they've heard over and over again on other yeah, shows. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Uh, the other thing that Molly and I have discovered is that they love unsolved. Mm -hmm. They like, no, there's not an answer. What would, might the answer be? You know, who could have? What might have? I think there's a great appetite for that as well. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's the, the fresh crimes, unsolved crimes, and there's a lot of interest, too, in unlikely crimes. Why would a 16-year-old, for example, kill a 6-year-old? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of interest in that, too. Yeah, know? like Mary, Mary Bell. Yeah, well, Mary Bell, I, I, I've done, I, I was a reporter when she was first arrested I've been doing this for such a long time um, what do you think what do you think's become of her I, I mean we don't really oh, know she's been relocated she given very successful witness protection um, uh, she married again married the second time um, she lives in happy obscurity Mm. And if you ask me, would she ever do it again? I doubt it. Mm. I doubt it. She was a very troubled 11-year-old who killed two young people, two children who came across her bowels. Maybe it was about um, attracting attention. Maybe because she was driven to it by a rather unhappy home, unhappy family. But there's been no sign since then. Mary Bell has is famous for being Mary Bell, but it's what almost nearly sixty years ago. Yeah, wow. uh, long, long time ago. And okay, now and let's let's give them your website as well, so that if they want to check you out and maybe check out some of your books. Well, if you look at my website, you just have to type into your your search engine Jeffrey Wansall, and you find my website. Um, and there are some books in there. Um, I think only one of them is in print in America at the moment, but uh, you can never tell. And I'm about to do another one, I think. And I'm about to do a, um, a Netflix uh, on a British serial killer called Dennis Nielsen, who um, stuffed his victims under the floorboards and kept their heads in the fridge. Um, uh, he killed 12 gay men uh, and uh, died only a year and a bit ago and uh, I'm involved in a, a documentary 
there is a drama actually being made at the moment as well about him, but um, I'm involved in the documentary about him. So, yeah, I don't... The, 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 the passion for this sort of material, Al, doesn't seem to go away. No, no. Mm -hmm. And there's an uh, endless supply to, to, to work on. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, that's the worst thing of all. Yeah. I wish there were less supply to work on, don't you? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess we get used to it. We're, we've been in it for so long that um, we sound kind of callous sometimes. That's why. Uh, but you need to. I laugh. don't think you should. I, I'm sure you're not. But I mean, I would say, from my perspective, that I'm. It, it, it changes you. This sort of work changes you, and mm -hmm. you never get it out of your head. But I think better that people like you and I and, and, and Mike, who clearly have it in perspective, I'd rather have that. I, I don't feel as though my life has been made impossible or awful by what I've learned and done and people I've talked to and the cases I've dealt with. I think I've I think I managed to survive with my head held high and with a sense of proportion. But it's not always easy to do because you learn so many dreadful things. Yeah, certainly. And you see so many photographs. Yeah. Mm. But that's why we have donuts. <laughs> <laughs> to make it all go <laughs> away. It, it makes it all go away, really. It was all the donuts. I'm glad <laughs> yeah. to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, donuts, coffee, tea, whatever. It all works. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Well, it's been a, a splendid conversation, and uh, we've really enjoyed having you on. Um, our guest, Jeffrey Lonson. Thank, so Thank much. you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely delight. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. The mission has been completed. The end! By George, he's got it! It is the end! I'll see you! If you're lying to me, I'll be back. This has been a production of Something Weird Media.